There has been a fascination with the believed powers of blood for eons. Many long vanquished cultures still give us glimpses into the ideas about the red liquid that pound inside of all of us. Yet, with a particular meaning towards European perceptions, we can still see lasting legacies over the potency of the liquid that expands over time and space. Medieval ideas about blood, with the exception of the drinking of Christ's Eucharist, most other European rituals concerning blood were viewed as macabre. Scenes dealing with blood were connected to death, such as the apocalyptical rivers, including God's plague upon the Nile. In addition, this image portrays widespread mistrust of both blood and Jews, in this conniving portrayal of them killing a young Christian boy to gather his blood for the Passover ritual. Moving our perceptions eastward to China, ideas of blood in antiquity were viewed through the lens of the Confucian idea of filial piety while implemented through the indigenous Buddhist pantheon. Take the filial case of Wu Mang in 265 AD. The boy's father and mother cannot afford a mosquito net. Thus, as the boy says to himself, all my blood comes from my parents. If this cannot be given to the mosquitoes, how can I do something to honor my parents when I grow up? The Blood Bowl Sutra demonstrates the extreme filial piety practices implemented even up into the Song Dynasty. The sutra called for the son to drink the menstruation blood of his mother to absorb the sins of her sexuality. Likewise, in the Fu Mu and Zhang Jing, the particular passage calls for a son to, for three years, you drink your mother's white blood to help repay the burden of his birth. The act of Ko Ku is a notorious filial rite designed for one to self-mutilate for the medicine of parents. The children's blood was considered an effective medicine for the mental decay of awareness within the old. Whether these tales are common practice or folklore is not of importance. The ideas that prevailed in China towards the filial practices of sharing blood across generations are not only unique to the culture, but that they tell a tale that blood was not perceived to be dark and associated with death, but founded on socially bound perceptions that were disseminated by the institutionalized religions and philosophies of China in antiquity. The following will examine medical views towards blood and the rise of medical explanations that superseded cultural views. One example is bloodletting. Bloodletting was the idea that illness is transferred by bad blood, which disrupts the humors. This appears commonly in Europe during the 15th century, but also occurred in China under the practice of cupping, which existed since ancient times. While the popularity of bloodletting in China never became a prevalent practice, as it marked the waste of precious irreplaceable body fluid, it was in Europe where seasonal bleeding was considered quite healthy. Medieval medical thought towards the benefits of routine bleeding are implicit. A bleeding in the spring is physic for a king, the English adage would remark with striking familiarity to a spring cleaning. Sagesha Kuriyama eloquently summarizes the human curiosity towards the voluntary release of blood. While the identification of blood with vitality sometimes militated against bloodletting, the association of qualities of blood and qualities of life made blood a compelling target of cures. Shu Da Chun was a conservative polymath and leading medical practitioner and scholar who called for a less progressive approach to the human body. To Shu Da Chun, Blood was seen to circulate across the body as found in the West, but its movements were inseparable with the five viscera, qi, shen, and jing. He states in his Ai Shui Yuan Liu Lun, Is it absolutely necessary to distinguish between the conduits and vessels, and between viscera and bowels? My answer would be, that is not the case. The human body, according to the high Chinese medical traditions, was seen in its whole, rather than the components of a clock, an idea that strikes conflict with the West. Altering notions that appear across spatial cultures, from ancient beliefs in the primordial power of blood, the rise of the religiosity of blood, and the exegetical observations of empirical medicine, we have on our hands a new wave of defining blood, the globalization of the biological explanation. While the changes in perceptions towards our sanguine fluid have varied across time and space, they nonetheless have a shared characteristic. Blood carries not only our vitality, but our cultural sense of self.